All right, we are recording and I'm going to try one last time to share into refracted light. All right, folks, thank you for joining us tonight. We are um, blessed to have a second shot at this panel, and I really appreciate everybody working with me and, and getting to a uh, um, point where we could uh, repeat this. Um, this panel in this manner has never been done before. This, this is going to be something that is um, hopefully repeated in the future, but we are the inaugural piece of this. Masons helping Masons. And how cool is that? What the point of this is, is that we can take this and not only help ourselves, but help ourselves in turning around and then helping the community around us, helping our external lodge, if you will. And that is uh, absolutely critical to what's going on here. During this presentation, I'm going to go ahead and ask that everybody uh, except the presenters go ahead and mute, mute now. And um, if there is any uh, interruptions or, or problems with the feed, um, if we have to shut down again, there probably won't be much in the way of warning. We'll just go ahead and shut it down. Um, we uh, have learned a few lessons from last time. Let's just call it that. Um, with that in mind, no undertaking of any Masonic function should ever be done without the invocation of deity. And uh, I've asked Brother Jake Thompson if he doesn't mind uh, giving a, an invocation. Yeah. Uh, brethren, if you please assume a attitude of reflection and prayer. Supreme Architect of the Universe, most holy and glorious Lord God, giver of all good gifts and graces, we thank you for allowing us to come together tonight for this discussion and meeting. And do us with thy wisdom and prepare us to be the best able to receive what is communicated and discussed this evening. Help us to exemplify the virtues of the mystic craft each and every day and grow better each and every day as men and Masons. Amen. So, so what 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 Thank you, Brother Jack. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. I'm going to uh, hand this over to Brother Chuck Dunning. Uh, most of you know Chuck and uh, are familiar with his works, and we are absolutely uh, honored to have you as a, a MC and facilitator tonight, Chuck. Thank you very much, Randy. Um, like you, I appreciate everybody who's helped us make this uh, event uh, happen again. And um, hopefully we have taken the necessary precautions and we'll get the necessary assistance to avoid any kind of interruption like we had last time. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share um, my, start sharing my slides here. And uh, we can get this show on the road. All right. So one of the things that recently happened was a conversation between me and some brothers that um, it might be really good to get together um, all of the mental health professional masons that we know and uh, see what kind of good might come from that. And one of the first thoughts we had was doing a panel discussion on uh, mental health in this time where we're all social distancing and uh, trying to make the best of, of sheltering in place and, and keep ourselves safe and safe and healthy. And uh, knowing that uh, those things can have a mental health impact and in some cases a very serious one. And so I contacted some of these brothers and you'll see their names here, all of whom are licensed in some way in the mental health field. 
and I'll be telling you more about them as we go through this and, and we'll go give each of them some time and then there'll be some time for panel discussion after each of their presentations. And then once we've gone through all those presentations, there will be a time for taking questions from the audience. Let me get to see if I can get to the next slide. There we go. So we got some guidelines tonight that I would like everybody to, um, to participate in. Um, we're not going to uh, uh, be conducting this as a private session. So everybody needs to know that if you are going to participate in discussion, that any information you share will be available to the public. You also need to know that this isn't a therapy or counseling session. And if you're in need of that, Please know that uh, we're providing some resources as we go through this, but we've got a number here that can be very helpful if you are in need of more urgent assistance. This help number, um, with the last four digits being 4357, interestingly, um, is, uh, is a wonderful place to start. It, it's not like calling 911. It's, it's calling uh, to actually talk with therapists who can help you figure out what you might need right now and where you can go to get that. Um, questions from the audience are welcomed by chat uh, during our panel presentations. Um, and uh, then after that, we'll, we may be able to open them up by voice. We'll see. Uh, there will be no political commentary by voice or by chat during this presentation. That's, uh, uh, it's, it's just not our purpose here tonight. And finally, we're going to do our best to make this slideshow available through the refracted uh, light uh, Facebook group, as well as the whole broadcast um, after it's done. So here's some relevant data to kind of give us a sense of what's going on in our country right now, mental health wise in relation to social distancing and sheltering in place. Um, so you'll see here that 48% uh, of Americans say that uh, they can hold out as long as they need to. But 19% say they can only do so a few more months and 18% are saying just a few more weeks is about all they can handle. Um, I suspect that we're already seeing in some of the uh, uh, things that are in the news lately about people complaining and struggling that, uh, that some of what we're seeing there is related to the stressors just of, of sheltering in place and isolation. 15% say their mental health is actually suffering now. And that's significant when you compare it to how many people say their physical health or their financial health is suffering. Uh, the people who are being impacted most by this experience are those in the 18 to 44 years of age range. Um, and um, you can see that the older people are not uh, struggling with it mental health wise as much, even if they might be more at risk in terms of their physical health. Uh, I suspect there's a significant correlation between that age range uh, and parents with minor children, 20% of whom say they're already having trouble with their mental health compared to 13% with no younger children at home. It's also important to remember that this survey is now a month old. Um, and so some of these numbers could actually be higher. All right. Our first presenter tonight is David Hill. Brother David Hill um, is a licensed psychologist. He's in Austin, Texas. Uh, you can see here on the slide uh, some of the things that he has been involved in, both professionally and Masonically. And uh, without further ado, David, it's your turn. Thanks, Chuck. Um, so I'll be talking briefly about depression this evening. Um, so there's many different types of depression, and most people will experience some depressive symptoms during their lifetime. Uh, the National Institute of Mental Health estimates that 7% of the population will experience at least one major depressive episode during a given year. Now, that's a, a very clinically significant, more intensive thing if it's being classed as major depression. But regardless, depressive thoughts are really common for everybody. It's sort of a uh, kind of a common cold of mental illness, depression, and anxiety. But uh, especially during a stressful event like this, I mean, a pandemic, it's bound to bring up a lot of material and, and uh, staying at home as well. So 
it's probably good to explore what symptoms of depression are so that you have a better sense of uh, what depression may be. Um, what I'll do is I'll list out the symptoms of major depression so you can see what, what might be occurring in your life uh, during this stressful time. So there's feelings of hopelessness, worthlessness, uh, low self-esteem, self-blame, so kind of beating yourself up over things. Um, you might have problems concentrating, feeling kind of a loss of energy, uh, loss of motivation as well, that's a big one. Um, sometimes things you enjoy, you just may not be feeling it so much. Um, might find yourself um, eating more or less than usual. I know uh, I've been eating more snacks than usual and I'm getting my COVID-15 on. Uh, also sleeping more or sleeping significantly less than usual is kind of common. <laughs> you know, you're getting yourself pulled out of equi equilibrium a little bit. Now, there's several different types of depression. So I'll, I'll talk about a, a couple real quick. So there's major depression, which I just listed off symptoms of. And that's usually you're stuck in a really deep depression for at least two wait, weeks, but it can linger significantly longer. Um, that can that can come and go at times, but sort of it's at least two weeks is sort of the minimum time for major depression. Now contrast that with dysthymia or persistent depression. And that's just kind of depressed mood most of the day for at least two years. So it's kind of a case of the blahs for a long time. It's not as severe as major depression, but with, with these, anything that has sort of a, a title like that, it has to have a level of clinical significance. So we're talking about something that's actively causing problems in your, your home life, your work life, your school life, uh, something along those lines. And we also have grief, which people may be experiencing some grief during this for, you know, um, for people who they've lost or, or maybe even just opportunities that they've lost, social opportunities even. Uh, it's a normal reaction to loss. Uh, you're probably aware of the, the DABDA model that uh, depression, um, anger, what, what denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Now, that's some people may experience some of those. They may experience all of them. Probably they're not going to experience them in that order in a neat little model like that. But those are some things that you may see that comes up kind of randomly with a grieving process. Uh, now, grief can become more severe. And, and if that's the case, then it's probably worth looking at getting some help for it. Um, I do want to touch base briefly on suicidal thoughts. Um, so I just want to normalize that. That's normal if you're going through a depressive process, having sort of fleeting thoughts of what if I wasn't here. Um, now, that's more of an escape fantasy. Like if the stressors or the bad things in your life were gone, probably you wouldn't have those thoughts. Now, it does start getting more concerning if you start having fantasies about a plan, how you do it or bringing together things for how to, how to actually make it happen, starting to have some intent towards doing that. That becomes concerning. Uh, at that point, you, you definitely want to call a, a professional. And don't try to assess this on your own. Definitely call a professional. Um, there's a number, uh, National Suicide Hotline. It's 1-800-273-TALK. That's a fantastic uh, resource if you feel like this may be an issue that you're looking at. Um, loss of motivation is something from depression I see is one of the most pernicious symptoms. That's one that will creep up on you pretty quick. You don't realize that you're really not getting stuff done. So it helps to maintain depression over time. And so that led me to reflect on the 24 inch gauge. You know, it's the first working tool we're presented with and it's used to measure and lay out your time. Well, if you use that to create a structure in your life, so every day you have some certain activities are going on at certain points during your day that gives you a little bit more structure to kind of hang your hat on so that you can move yourself with that scaffolding a little bit further along without that loss of motivation. Uh, now, when we're talking about depression, most people think of uh, vegetative depression where you're just kind of laying there like a sad lump. Uh, but there's also an agitated depression you might want to watch out for where people are just getting irritable and grumpy and maybe snippy and angry. Uh, so watch out. You might be acting out instead of acting in. Um, really watch yourself for symptoms of depression during this thing because, it, I mean, it's going to take its toll on everybody to different degrees. Kind of put steps in place to combat those, those particular symptoms when you notice them. Uh, Jung had a concept that I really like uh, called mental hygiene. Sort of you brush your teeth, so you might as well make sure your brain's squeegeeing too. Um, you know, uh, in the Scottish Rite, we know about the importance of equilibrium. 
right? If you start noticing these symptoms I mentioned early on and correct them, it's pretty easy to get back to center. But if you don't notice them, they get better, and they get the better of you, it's real hard to wrench that sort of balance back to that point of equilibrium. Uh, also, one brief note on alcohol. Uh, I know alcohol sales are through the roof right now. Um, alcohol is a depressant. So if you are having some depressive symptoms, uh, maybe consider other coping strategies because alcohol can increase them and can cause sleep problems as well. Any questions? David, it's Eric. I was wondering, for people who've had depression in the past and uh, they've been feeling better for a long time and now they might be getting nervous that some of those same signs or symptoms are creeping back in, what, what would you recommend? Sure. Um, well, like I said, if you have had depression in the past, probably you, you will hopefully uh, be more adept at determining what those symptoms are and paying attention when they're starting to creep back in. If you start noticing creeping back in, put something in place to counter that. So if you're having loss of motivation, start, um, start having tasks throughout the day. You know, set some alarms on your phone to make sure you're doing things when you're supposed to be doing them. Um, you know, if you find yourself uh, eating for comfort, maybe instead go take a walk around the neighborhood, get some fresh air, see some people walking around without getting too close. Uh, put, put some sort of coping mechanisms in place that'll help balance that out. Yeah, thanks, Eric. That's a good question. Yeah, here you can see some uh, some resources as well uh, that that are useful. Also, the therapist finder search engine down there. Most of us are on that. So if you're uh, looking for somebody, it has a sort of a bio, a photo, uh, you know, what insurance people cover, and everything on there. David, my question is, um, you know, sometimes we may not be experiencing depression or we might be experiencing depression, but we might notice that um, those, some of those symptoms you talked about in others, what are your recommendations about how we should uh, respond when we think someone that we care about might be suffering with depression? Uh, good question. Yeah. For that, I think that's an issue where you're not a mental health professional. So don't directly intervene and say, Hey, I think you have per depression. You know, I, that's inappropriate, but we are tasked as Masons to whisper good counsel to our brethren. Um, we should be there for our brethren. So just uh, come up as a friend and just ask them how they're doing. You know, if they're, if they're not doing okay, they may tell you, if not, um, just let them know, Hey, I, I'm here if you need anything. Uh, even, just having someone express concern may be huge. There's a lot of times when you're depressed that you feel like you're alone in the world and um, nobody's there for you. And why isn't anybody noticing? Just notice, say something as a brother. Thank I think you. one other thing that we might mention too is just because we have some of these symptoms or feelings doesn't mean we're clinically diagnosable. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like I said, the, the having depressive feelings is incredibly normal. It's really normal. Everybody's going to feel low at some point in their life. Uh, this is a good point with the added stress where it's likely to happen. Um, in order to be kind of clinically diagnosable, I mean, it has to be pretty severe and really getting in the way of your your functioning on a daily basis. I mean, in a period, a brief period of, of stress, kind of more acute compressed kind of period like this, yeah, chances are you, you might have something come up, but once that stress is gone, it sort of relaxes again. Um, a more clinical thing would be you get stuck into this process. All right, David, thank you very much for uh, introducing us to these thoughts about depression and um, how we might be able to cope with them a little more effectively and maybe know when we need to reach out for help a little sooner. Okay, we're going to advance now to our next panelist. Sorry about the uh, flipping through the slides there. We've got Eric Marks coming up. Um, he is uh, a licensed clinical social worker in Massachusetts. And um, he currently works with uh, student mental health and counseling at MIT of all places. 
Um, he has been doing private psychotherapy since 2002. He's a relatively new master mason, uh, but already making a great name for himself. And if you haven't checked out some of his writings online, I would definitely encourage you to look at Midnight Freemasons and see some of the things he has to say there. All right, Eric, talk to us about stress and anxiety management. Thanks, Chuck. It's good to be back and it's good to see some uh, new faces and some faces I know. So I think of uh, stress and anxiety sort of like the Tyler's alarm. Stress is a natural part of life and it is the taxation of living. And I think of it in kind of two broad categories. The kind of stress that we feel good about, uh, which I'll call U stress, EU stress, and then the kind that doesn't feel so good, which we could just call it distress. And uh, the, the positive things that we do that are still taxing our systems, falling in love, getting married, becoming a Mason, uh, being raised to a master Mason, maybe becoming an officer, um, they all have positive connotations for us. And so those meaningful things, the part that we feel really good about, have a protective factor that make the stress not as noticeable. We might still be tired out, but we feel good. And so it doesn't feel like stress. The other part where things are more painful, um, a boss who's really uh, pushy or short-sighted, um, maybe fighting at home, uh, unemployment right now, very stressful, and we don't feel good about it. And one of the things that I'll keep coming back to again and again is the idea that humans make meaning of everything. I'll say this a couple of different times. And that the meaning we make of things can really change uh, the effect that any event has on us. So as we get more and more upset about something, as it's more and more stressful, the alarm gets stronger. And the part of our brain that is charged with taking care of us to noticing uh, danger is called the amygdala. It's not very smart, uh, but it's kind of like the Tyler outside the door. And when it decides that something's dangerous, it gets us ready to respond. Now, one of the things that it likes the least is uncertainty. And it's sort of like the saber-toothed tiger. And right now, there's a lot of uncertainty. We don't know when things are opening up. We don't know who or when someone will fall sick. And that's, that's really scary for the amygdala. And so it, it gets us charged up a lot. Some of the things you will feel is a tightening in your throat, maybe heart racing, uh, pit in your stomach, um, sweating. You might also feel really cold. There's some of the physical symptoms. Uh, in fact, sometimes people become so anxious they think they're having a heart attack. And there are lots of times when I have someone uh, referred to me who's gone to an ER uh, thinking that they're dying, and the doc says, no, it's just anxiety. Some of the psychological symptoms that we'll experience are uh, our mind shutting down. It's very hard to think. Or we might go in the opposite direction where we're ruminating about things, about fears, about the future, and we get stuck in these thought loops. That leads us to four different states that our mind uses to respond. And two of them most people know, fight or flight. So the fight response is the one that sometimes can be the most effective. It can get us ready to uh, take on the problem, do something effective, really take charge and change things. That can become a little bit problematic when the fight um, stays more localized. We might get more agitated or angry with family, friends, other brothers. And so that can become a little more aggressive. People don't mean it, but it's sometimes the way that anxiety uh, or even just extreme stress gets played out. Then there's the flee part where our brain wants us just to avoid anything related to the situation uh, at hand. And when the situation is life, it's really hard because people get stuck in video games or maybe reading lots of Masonic texts. That would be actually a productive way of dealing with the anxiety. The other two modes that people don't know so much about is freeze and fatigue. We could also call it sleep. The freeze part is it's very hard to recall things. And this often happens in social settings when someone gets suddenly very stressed or anxious and you can't remember the things that you always remember. And then the fatigue part is your, your mind essentially wants you to go to sleep to avoid the situation. And we could think of these as the ruffians of mind that attempt to take from us some aspect of the truth. Um, our mind gets clouded by ideas that are blown out of proportion of the situation. And uh, anxiety, these ruffians uh, take away from us the idea that things could be okay. And it makes it much more difficult to connect with things at work or with divinity. And I see 
uh, masonry as kind of an ideal training tool for dealing with life. So we, many of us think of all aspects of the physical lodge as representations of our psychology. And if you like that idea, you can go to The Way of the Craftsman by McNulty. It's, it's an amazing book. And each degree can represent an aspect of our own psychological development and move towards closer and closer to the divine. So masonry is ideal because at its core, at its foundation, it knows that humans make meaning of everything. It's, it's just built into it. And that's why we look for symbolic meaning in specific tools and ideas. And it, it invites us to look internally for what these messages from the Tyler are trying to tell us about our own experience. We try to make meaning of everything. So we try and make meaning of this uncertainty. We try to find a solution. Sometimes we dream up conspiracy theories that are not well-founded. We try to dampen it, like David said, with, with substances of some kind, which, which we can call that stress suppression. It causes the stress to not feel like it's happening, but it doesn't actually manage it. And we'll do anything to try and just get away from, from feelings. And masonry asks us to say yes to strong emotion to the ruffians, and to explore our experience more deeply. One of the beauties of life and about masonry is that cycles repeat themselves. We go around the, the wheel of the year, we go around the point within the circle, and we get a chance to perfect ourselves. And the same thing is true with stress and anxiety. We could see it only as symptoms or things that try to uh, keep us from the things that we want to do, or we could say, this is my Ashler. I have to keep working at this and life keeps handing it back to me. So we can try and decode what our alarmist Tyler is saying. Like, what is it saying to me? What am I so afraid of? What is scaring me? I don't know what's going to happen. And so we can try and seek light through each other, through the brethren, through our texts, to the symbols in Lodge. And we try and use those as a way of anchoring ourselves of finding our way back to center in the middle. I often think of uh, gratitude as a gavel. So gratitude acts against all the chemicals that cause us to have this fight or flight, freeze or fatigue response. When we are grateful for things in our lives, it accesses a different aspect of our physiology and it releases different chemicals. And we start to feel calmer, we feel more loving. And so when we do that, we push back against these ruffians. We remember the manifold blessings all around us, in each other, our families, if we have them, work if we have it. And so we begin the process, we invoke deity. And there, there are lots of processes, even when we're not in Lodge, that people have written about. So Chuck's book is an excellent resource that help us sit still in the middle of all this discomfort and try and neutralize it in our, in our inner lodge. We recall the blessings. We use gratitude as a way of relaxing, feeling better. And then we re-engage in the labor. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. I'm wondering if we have any uh, comments or questions from our other panelists on stress and anxiety management. Hi, Jeff. Uh, Go ahead. Oh, sure. Oh. Um, I was thinking about the the importance of breath in managing anxiety. Uh, could you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, so when we get stressed or anxious, our, our breathing usually becomes more shallow. We breathe very short breaths. They don't use much of our lungs. And the part of our body that is responsible for breathing is something called the diaphragm. It's a muscle that's horizontal like this. And that when it pulls down, our lungs inflate. And so a really easy technique to use is to pretend that you're breathing into your guts. You can't do it. But by pretending that you're doing that, so right now if you put your hands on your stomach, I can see you, you can do it. So you put your hands on your stomach and you breathe in and you breathe in and you breathe in and all of your, your stomach expands. No one can see you. So just try and breathe as far into your intestines as you can. It's a physical metaphor. And what the physical metaphor does 
is that it causes your lungs to inflate fully, but it does something else to your mind. The moment that you're trying to figure out how to breathe into your intestines, you stop worrying about everything else. And you slow down and you end up right here in this moment. And so by slowing that down even more, do it as slowly as you can, breathe in as slowly as you can, as deeply as you can, then hold it, hold it for as long as you can, and then exhale for as long as you can. And that while you're doing that, all that thinking about your body and the counting and all that stuff, everything else kind of disappears. The other thing that happens is you get more oxygen, which is inherently calming. It also mimics something called the parasympathetic nervous system. So when we're responding and reacting to the world, when we're upset and worried about what's going to happen, it's called the sympathetic or the reactive nervous system. The parasympathetic is the part that kicks in when we're asleep. It's the part that repairs things. So by doing diaphragmatic breathing, which we can do anywhere, you can do it in the line at the supermarket. You kind of have to manage your breathing a little bit, though, because if you're breathing really loudly, people get a little freaked out. But, <laughs> um, but just breathe nice and softly, and it's calming. <clears throat> Thanks, Eric. Um, I hope that maybe uh, when we get into the question and answer session, we can talk a little bit more about some grounding techniques and other things that um, our audience might be able to put into practice. Let's move on now to our next presenter, Brother Lorenzo Ramos, who is a licensed psychologist in California. Uh, you can see that he works for the Department of Corrections, and uh, he's also a very active Mason out there as well. And I've had the opportunity to, to meet Lorenzo and, um, and speak with him at some length. And I know that he's a, a very knowledgeable and a deep Mason. So I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say about social isolation. Lorenzo, you're up. Thank you very much, Chuck. Um, yeah, so in, in preparing this, um, this presentation on uh, social, I mean, um, social isolation and loneliness, I, uh, with the time we had, I decided to focus more on insight-oriented coping skills, uh, kind of catered to masons and masonry. Um, it's mostly because, you know, taking a look at, at the research, uh, a lot of the psychological research on loneliness tends to be focused uh, kind of on the clinical failure to connect, like in, in, inability to connect, saying if society is all normal uh, and you are lonely, then why is that? And that goes into a number of internal factors and theories and models. Uh, but right now, we're not in that kind of world. Right now, it's, this is about coping with uh, loneliness because of the pandemic and the lockdowns. So um, I did find one, one model that kind of speaks to what I'm trying to get at. Uh, it's from... Um, it's from a sociologist uh, who developed his theory of loneliness based on six needs. Uh, I, I, was, I, I want to focus on this idea of our needs and unmet needs. So he, he came up with you know, saying that um, our relationships uh, supply us with attachment, social integration, a nurturance, reassurance of worth, or a sense of uh, reliable alliance and guidance in stressful situations. Um, and saying that, you know, if you don't have these, or if you have a lack of social, if you have social isolation or lack of social integration, these uh, needs do not go, uh, they're not met. So um, a lot of the work that I do is about looking at what these unmet needs are and, um, you know, trying to kind of focus on how and why we're meeting them. So there's, um, there was um, this bit about mental hygiene mentioned earlier. I think that as Masons, we're sort of charged to have this, um, this faculty active within us. Um, I, I noted something from the first degree charge that basically calls us to practice some sort of discipline, perhaps the, the, the craft that may best conduce to the preservation of our corporeal and mental faculties in their fullest energy. Uh, and in looking at this idea of what, um, what this temperance could be, you know, uh, mental hygiene seems to fit very well. Uh, these are all kind of terms that do come right back to this mindful awareness, uh, practicing, you know, being grounded, centered, clearing the filter, as I like to say. We can have all these automatic thoughts, subconscious mind doing its things, but um, our 
pure core awareness is just you know witnessing reality so now this sort of um this led me to, to consider you know what um masons might be doing in this time what does it mean to not um have uh, lodge meetings all the time some people you know go to uh go to lodge a lot you know other people uh, uh, focus on the studies but you know being in touch with our brother and having this network is a big deal so uh loneliness in, in this time um you know made me think of this question that i often ask my patients um you know are you a, a mason in an empty room i ask them are you are you who are you in an empty room but for us it would be like are you a mason in an empty room uh, if you're not going to lodge you know what um what is left um i wanted to bring up the idea of like uh, conditional and unconditional identities uh a lot of our social roles are conditional uh even in this theory of attachment we can see that you know if you're getting nurturance reassurance of worth your um you know guidance in stressful situations from others you know if that's the cue for your loneliness you're feeling these unmet needs then i i invite you to turn toward uh the unconditional aspect of your identity what part of the craft have you internalized you know has has masonry uh offered something to us that we join and take part in and then are called to become i think that when you become a mason you are unconditionally a mason you would be a mason in an empty room and i um i hope that we're all practicing this you know reading reading the texts you know practicing the arts having our own ritual or maybe if you're uh, in the officer's line you have plenty to memorize already so that should keep you busy um so yes i um i'm basically taking loneliness to be a sort of a constructive pain response i mean pain tells us that we need attention somewhere uh in the body right pain is not fun but it's a uh, it's a symptom of something that needs to be addressed and here i'm um, i'm suggesting it's these unmet needs that are brought up with your experience of loneliness i said that isolation is a sort of a forced retreat a lot of times when you really take on this work you purposefully target it um this idea of like ego death targeting the parts of us that that need this attention to uh, to truly develop ego strength resiliency and even beyond the ego i think you know uh, an an um a connection or communion with our essence which is this um this awareness so as for these uh coping skills i um i suggested two from um the acceptance and commitment therapy uh modality uh diffusion and reidentification reidentification is a little bit more on the uh spiritual side but uh diffusion is something we can do just to uh when you're practicing mindful awareness to just become aware that the thoughts are there the feelings are there uh what can you do to um you know diffuse from these things and reidentify with with something uh greater something uh, um is it a greater being greater than the sum of its parts oh you know what i mean um diffusion would would basically be this act of practicing a sort of inner death i've heard in some eastern traditions um they say that the the practitioner the veera or the yogin he experiences a thousand inner deaths every day and this um this solemnity is certainly present in our craft so uh, again i call it, i call for us to to contemplate the meaning of the degrees and to to practice this and develop an unconditional sense of your uh, your masonic work um i mentioned one bit here at the end a last sort of piece about buffering reality with distractions um we we do have a lot of uh resources around us i mean i'm sure a lot of us have plenty of books and things to study we might be quarantined alone or with other people but um i think that for someone who's engaged in this type of work the idea of a uh, of buffering reality becomes very important um coping skills could be you know like um watching watching uh, something on netflix you know going out for a drink doing whatever it is practicing an art working on a project but on this on this level that we're speaking of these are again ultimately distractions from this work that is always there so i think as a mason we're called to constantly be engaged in this work which is um it sort of transcends and uh in is um 
part of like our daily life. It's like saying you could be doing this work while you're just going about your business. No one would really know what you're doing. Kind of like the practicing these grounding breaths in line at the grocery store. Uh, I think connecting to that is probably this, uh, this re-identification I'm talking about, a way to really bring it into your life. Um, I think that might be it based on our time. All right, Lorenzo, thank you very much. I'm wondering um, if any of the panelists have anything else to add or any questions they'd like to ask Brother Ramos. Lorenzo, the question that I have for you is um, similar to the one that I asked David. It's, it's a question about um, thinking about the social isolation challenges that others might be struggling with. What kind of thoughts or ideas might you have about that? Hmm, about when we, um, when we see others who are feeling quite lonely. Um, yeah. And what, what we might look for as clues to that and how we might respond. As clues to their loneliness. Hmm? Uh, well, I think that a lot of these, um, a lot of what our other uh, brethren are speaking about could be these symptoms. I mean, loneliness is probably one of the most uh, subjective experiences. You know, a, a lot of, there's a lot of overlap between all these uh, topics that we're um, discussing today. Yes. And um, I think, you know, based on what we're hearing as a whole today in this presentation, you know, a lot of these, um, a lot of these things can uh, bleed together. So, you know, someone's loneliness could be part of their depressive presentation, or it could be fueling their anxiety. I mean, the idea that it's like a relational piece, you know, it's, it's an interpersonal thing, um, you know, leads me to, to suggest connecting with people, yeah. you know, like we're doing now, we're all, we might all be alone right now, but we're still connecting by talking to people and uh, you know, just connecting with them, we can essentially get to a place where we can guide them to somewhere they need to go. Trying to yeah. speak in the universal sense possible. I, and it certainly reminds me of that principal tenet of relief, um, that loneliness is something that we can relieve people of. All right, thank yeah. you, brother. Thank we you will much. move on to our next presenter, Brother Frank Zepp who is a licensed professional counselor down in the Austin area. And you'll see that um, he is uh, working currently in mental health, uh, particularly with veterans. He's also a very involved Mason and in doing just about everything he can possibly do down there. I understand that uh, people who knew him before he became a Mason have forgotten who he is. So <laughs> with no further ado, Frank, you are up. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. <laughs> well, welcome everybody to tonight. And um, what we're going to do is talk about our usual vocations. And, and no one expected that when this COVID-19 hit our nation that we would expand our vocabulary to using words such as work from home, uh, social distancing, etc. And, you know, some of us probably thought this flu was nothing more than a flu on steroids or Perhaps some even thought it was a hoax, but as you can look at the numbers, if you track the John Hopkins University maps and whatnot, it's, it's pretty serious business out there, and it's causing some serious mental health issues, as we've talked uh, earlier before. Um, <clears throat> and with the pandemic, of course, came the closings of businesses that may or may not reopen, schools, churches, sporting events, uh, even fraternal organizations such as ours, uh, under direction of the various grand masters and grand presiding officers, had to make those tough but prudent decisions to cancel all meetings. You know, and and for those of us, or for those in the audience who may not have been deemed as essential employees, well, many lost their jobs, were furloughed, some were forced to work from home, um, and working from home has its challenges, as you can imagine, if you're not used to it. Um, you know, the kids are now home because they may not be in school. The wife, if she worked, is, may be home or your, your significant other may be home. And so productivity may decrease due to a lot of distractions. But I want to call your attention to a mindset that I think might help you to rethink some things. And I, I call it the parable of the lesson or lemon and a lesson from David and Goliath. You know, if I, if I was holding a lemon in my hand, I'd ask you what color is the lemon. And you'd say, well, Frank, it's yellow. 
And I'd say, hey, put these blue sunglasses on. You got those blue sunglasses on? Good. What color's the lemon? Well, it's green. Blue and yellow make green. Cool. Or it's blue. Some of you might say, no, the lemon is still yellow. So it may not be what we're looking at, but perhaps how we're looking at it. So we may need to change our filters. Everyone's familiar with the story of David and Goliath. You know, David's a little shepherd boy at the time, a teenager. And you got the army of Israel facing the uh, Philistine army. And they've got Goliath out there who goes about seven foot 12. And he's getting everybody to, you know, hey, if you beat me, you win the day. And he said, who's your champion? Bring them out. And what's David do? He comes out and he goes, what's going on? And the children of Israel are saying, he's so big, we can't miss. He's so big, we can't miss. So what's David do? He picks up some rocks. He goes, he kind of looks back at the army and he goes, <laughs> Goliath's so big, I can't, I can't miss. Okay. So he grabs it, he goes, and he runs towards the giant and he lets go of the sling. The rock hits, as we know the story, and he cuts the man's head off with his own sword. And David probably reaches down and he looks at the other Philistine army and he goes, you know what? My God's bigger than you'll ever be. Don't sing it, bring it. But notice what David did. He ran toward the giant. He didn't run away. See, David's mindset wasn't, he's so big, we can't win. He's so big, I can't miss. You know? Now, are you working from home for the first time? Yes, it could be daunting. You know, maybe you don't have enough computers. Maybe you don't have enough office space. Franklin Covey, um, <clears throat> who you may remember, does a lot of different planning type things, a lot of business um, organization tools. Uh, perhaps you remember Stephen Covey, who wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, one of the colleagues there by the name of Suzette Blakemore gives 11, um, uh, 11 tips to make working from home a little easier. I'm not going to go through all those due to time, but there's two that she did not put on here. Um, the first one is keeping your normal schedule. You know, when we talk about our usual vocation, we talked about the 24 inch gauge and how we balance things out and we divide our time, you know, keep your schedule because it gives you structure. Okay. You know, if you're the kind of person that gets up at five o'clock in the morning, works out, takes a shower, has a little breakfast, grabs your coffee, hops in the car, runs to work, drives off to work. Great. Keep that same schedule. But what do I do about the car time, the, the commute time? Well, do you listen to a podcast during that time? Do you listen to certain news? If you have to get into the car and listen to it, go ahead and do it. I just recommend you crack the windows, okay? Um, but keep the schedule. And, and folks, if you are working from home and you're doing any kind of telecommuting, okay, to whether you're using Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever, for God's sakes, wear pants. Okay, um, but if you look, if you get a chance when you'll see the um, when the uh, references come up, you'll see a link there to uh, Franklin Covey's uh, Suzette Blakemore's um, eleven tips, and a lot of those tips are making a space at home for yourself. Okay, making it quiet, making it free of distractions, uh, making it your own, keeping your schedule like you normally would. If you had a meeting with your colleagues, you keep that schedule. I think David mentioned earlier, setting a timer on your phone to help you, okay? Um, Franklin Covey also has a little article on there about the five choices of extraordinary productivity. I don't know about you, but if I'm working from home, I get distracted pretty easily, you know? Shiny, there's all kinds of stuff around, you know? But those extraordinary productivity tips really help. Just listen to some of these. Act on the important. Don't react on the urgent. Go for the extraordinary. Don't settle for the ordinary. Schedule the big rocks. Don't sort gravel. Rule your technology. Don't let it rule you. Fuel your fire. Don't burn out. A um, lot of great tips on that website, and I hope that you can uh, you get a chance to take a look at it. You know, work in our vocations gives us a sense of purpose perhaps gives us a task and purpose to use a, a military term. And when we go to work, we feel connected to our, to our colleagues and we're, we're about doing our task. And it's, it's, you know, it's a goal, it's a mission, an objective, something that we're reaching for. It's not just a means to an end in order to, you know, pay the mortgage or whatnot, 
but it does gives us a sense of identity, all right? We've heard the term working in the quarries a lot, okay? And a lot of us enjoy working in the quarries. We like getting our hands dirty. Yes, 20, how's it go? 20% <laughs> of the, uh, of a lot of masons do 80% of the work in the lodge buildings? Well, maybe. But the fact of the matter is, is that it does give you some kind of sense of, of purpose and identity, okay? Now you might be thinking, well, Frank, all that's great, that's wonderful, that's dandy, but I, uh, I lost my job, now what, okay? Um, I know in the state of Texas that there is the Texas Workforce Commission uh, as a start, which is funded by the U.S. Department of Labor. And it's a good starting point for folks to look at possibly tweaking resumes, um, looking for other job choices. Uh, hopefully, um, the, your employer will take you back, they'll open up businesses again, and you can resume that. Uh, and it's going to cause a lot of stress, like, um, like some of our other panelists have talked about. Um, but I do encourage you to start looking at some of those. You'll see some of the other resources there that you can get into. Um, but what do you do when, you know, what's your reality? You know, you can't pay the mortgage or you can't buy food for your, for your family. Well, that's going to cause a lot of pain and consternation, you know. But breathe. Change your mindset a little bit, okay? Find other ways. You know, masonry has a way of providing relief. I know in, in Texas, um, the Grand Master put out a proclamation, and there is a relief fund there available for some, okay, uh, that lodges can tap into if, if, if they need it. Um, and there's nothing wrong with brothers helping brothers like taking food over or helping do some repairs, okay, um, just little things to help. But brother and, and, and guest, I, I, hope that, I hope that you will take some of these tips and that you'll you'll change your mindset a little bit. And, and hopefully, eventually when this thing lifts, because I believe someday it will lift uh, and we'll get back to, back to work, back to our jobs. And again, finding that meaning and purpose, even in the midst of this chaos. Right? Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, you know, one of the things that I really loved about your presentation was this talk about, you know, Goliath was so big that he couldn't mm -hmm. be missed. And one of the ways that was meaningful to me was thinking about what if, if we have lost a job, everything that we, we've got all this time, right? And everything that we can be doing mm -hmm. with our time in terms of, like you said, uh, going to the Workforce Commission, mm -hmm. touching up the resume, uh, doing informational interviews. So finding people that are doing the kind of work that you would like to be doing or or running the kind of companies that you would like to work for and going out and meeting those people and asking them what they see as the future for, you know, their hiring and, and, and the kind of people they're going to be looking for. There's just so much that can be done. And the people that are doing that, the people that have lost work and are, are taking advantage of this time to do that are the ones that are going to be, best positioned to get jobs as the job market starts to pick back up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yep. All right. Yeah, te yeah, Texas Veterans Commission will have a lot of good resources and I'm sorry, Texas Workforce Commission. If you are a veteran, there is a part of the Texas Workforce Commission. Uh, they kind of work alongside called the Texas Veterans Commission, and they can also help veterans uh, with some other resources as well. Okay, let's move on now to our final panelists. And after, after we've heard from him, then we'll have an opportunity for open discussion. So Paul Pennington is a licensed professional counselor down in Round Rock and um, also a very involved Mason. And um, you can see that his specialty in counseling is as an elementary school counselor. So here's a man who works with parents and kids pretty routinely. And, um, and so it's appropriate that he's gonna be talking to us about parenting and family and how this COVID-19 situation might be impacting that and, and what can be done. Paul, please enlighten us. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, you know, to kind of piggyback on where uh, Frank left us, uh, or started us, I guess, with the lemon. You know, the perception is reality for a lot of people. You know, if you can't, 
if you see one thing and you can't imagine it any other way, you know, that, that can be pretty stressful. Um, you know, I think of, um, you know, for the Masons here, how did you feel on the way to your entered apprentice degree? You know, that, that was a really big deal. And, you know, as more experienced Masons, now we may be getting ready to uh, put on that degree. And we have a, you know, a different sense of confidence. We know what's coming, what's ahead of us. Uh, you know, so it's very different perspectives. And I think we need to remind ourselves about that with our kids too, that, you know, if, how many of you can remember uh, maybe a first crush or, you know, uh, something you really, really wanted, a bicycle, a Red Rider BB gun, you know, that was the most important thing to you at that time. Uh, you know, for some of us, we still love those Red Riders, but you know, we've kind of moved on with what we like too. Uh, and I just think that if we go back and try and put ourselves in the position of the uh, children in our houses, the spouses, you know, everybody's coming from a little bit of a different angle. Uh, let's see. Uh, be factual and honest about the situation. So I primarily work with elementary school students and a lot of times people don't feel like they can uh, be honest. You know, they talk about, you know, oh, somebody may be sick or, you know, and there's developmentally appropriate levels to speak to kids about the pandemic and what's going on. Um, the last day I was in school this year was the day before spring break. And the very last class I was in was a second grade class. And I was doing a guidance lesson. And it was a uh, dual language class. It was a really small class. I think there were only 13 kids there. And we were talking and doing my normal spiel. And, you know, I was talking about uh, safety over spring break. You know, be sure you're talk to a trusted adult. People know where you're going. Uh, and one of the kids uh, raised their hand and said, Mr. Pennington, what if we all die? And I thought, whoa, you know, what's, what's going on here? And the teacher, she's over in the corner and she's just losing it. And I said, well, you know what? Let's talk about this. What do we know right now about what's going on? And what, what can we control? And, you know, and kind of took that approach with it. And by the end of the conversation, you know, and it was only a few minutes, uh, I said, you know, hey, this is what I know about from the news. Um, this is what I understand I can do to keep myself safe. And really, I can't control what anybody else is going to do. So what is in my uh, locus of control? My, what can I control? And kind of go from there. Obviously, you know your kids pretty well. So if there's, you know, speak to their level. Uh, but give them a chance. And I would honestly ask for their opinion. What do you know? What do you want to know? What concerns you the most? And then address those. Um, kind of go at it that way. Um, and then as everybody else has said, stick to a schedule and maintain consistency as much as possible. I know that's a huge one for me. Um, I work at the elementary school. I have to be to work uh, about seven o'clock in the morning. My wife is a high school teacher. She's got to be there at, I think, 830 or some, somewhere around there. Totally different schedules. Uh, it, but you've got to maintain, I do anyways, I have to maintain some consistency or I end up sleeping all day, you know, or I might get up and, you know, kind of piddle around. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh man, back to back meetings, you know, for the next three hours and I didn't get anything done. And then I'm stuck in front of a computer. Uh, so trying to maintain and, you know, stick that schedule uh, I would disagree with one of our panelists about wearing pants. Um, but I, I think as long as you're, uh, whatever is visible um, is, you know, <laughs> maintain that professionalism. You know, if, if you go to work every day, you know, if you work at Lowe's and you wear a vest and obviously you're still working, but you know, you, if you had a video chat, you might put that vest on, you know, you might, um, you know, I had one meeting where we were doing some interviews and I actually put on pants, like real pants. It was crazy. Uh, I was getting ready for this tonight and uh, I put on a different shirt and I tucked my shirt into my basketball shorts and my wife laughed at me 
But I said, you know what? I'm not getting up. At least I'm wearing a shirt with buttons on it. So kind of, you know, feel that one out. But if you have some consistency, it's going to make it a lot easier, especially for the kiddos. Uh, you guys know how hard it is when you go back to school at the beginning of the year, then when you go back from Christmas and getting into those routines, uh, it, it makes a huge difference. The one thing that I've really learned about kids is most of them don't have a lot of control or don't feel like they do. Uh, so uh, if you're working with your kid, give them as much um, autonomy, uh, as much choice as you can, and that'll help them feel like they're in control of the situation. And, uh, you know, pick your battles for sure. Uh, you know, if it's, it's, if it's uh, something that you just firmly believe in, uh, you will not wear a hat in this house. Hey, if that's the way you want it, go with it. But if it's something that isn't as big of a deal to you, you might think about letting it slide a little bit. Um, just, you know, at this time, grace, goes a long way. You know, I've, I've been working, I've got uh, 835 ish students at my school, about 90 staff members, kind of talking through things with everyone. And, and, you know, including my house, my wife, she's a calculus teacher. So she's in her office during the day, I'm in my office, we're trying to figure out what to do, how to teach how to be a counselor from home. Uh, and, you know, listening to some of the struggles that everybody else is having. And it's okay. You know, you don't have to be Superman. You don't have to be Superwoman. Uh, we'll make it through. Along with that is, you know, schoolwork, ADHD, and other diagnosis. Uh, you know, if, if a student or an adult has ADHD, it's going to be pretty hard uh, to focus sometimes. You know, Frank was talking about shiny things in his office. I've got books. I've got this. I've, I've got Candy Crush. Man, mm -hmm. you do a lot with that, right? stick to that schedule, pay attention, but be mindful of what other people may have going on too. If my wife's in her office, I'm not going to leave the door to my office open and have my speakers turned up loud, kids talking, parents maybe talking, teachers. Um, I'm going to work in drug and alcohol use here too. Uh, everybody makes their own choices in what they do. Be mindful of how those choices impact other areas. You know, if, if I usually come home from school and I have a couple glasses of scotch or a couple of beers, my attitude and the way I see things, the way I perceive things and react to things is going to be much different. Um, I may be calmer. I may be a little more intense. But be mindful of that just as much as if you have a head cold and you can't hear. You might say, can you speak up? You know, I'm sorry, my head's plugged up. I can't hear anything. Uh, you know, things are different. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm not saying no judgment, but just be mindful of how that impacts you and what you're seeing and the things you're engaged upon. Um, as far as the kiddos go, really monitor their gaming, Snapchat, cell phone, cyberbullying, and just appropriateness um, across social media and things like that. A lot of times kids just don't understand uh, and that can be really tough. Uh, so you might tell them, hey, you know what? Uh, I understand we're at home a lot more. I'm gonna let you use your phone more than you usually do, but I'm gonna wanna check in on that every once in a while just to make sure you're okay. Not that I'm smarter than you because I'm 40 and you're 10, but I do have more experience. I've just woken up and lived more days. So you may be smarter in this area. I may have more smarts in this area. Our brains are made of all sorts of different smarts, but just, you know, I, I wanna be sure you're safe. Um, and the last thing is uh, there's all sorts of, on Facebook, any kind of social media, people putting up pictures of crafts and fun activities, things they're doing with their kiddos. Um, not all parents can do that or have the time or are made for it. Don't sweat it. Um, I'm an elementary school counselor. I'm pretty goofy, I'll admit to that. But I'm not the smiling, cute, little, just out of college that you know a lot of elementary school counselors are. You know, I'm shaking hands, yes sir, no sir. Um, sometimes that's just the way we are. Don't beat yourself up over it. Do what you can. 
try to enjoy the time you have. And I'm going to drop it there because I am way over time. <laughs> but just have some grace with yourself. Well, thanks, Paul. And um, so here's some resources that uh, might be useful to uh, individuals and families where you think you might need a little extra help. Um, great resources at youth.gov. There's just a wealth of stuff there. Some hotlines that can be really useful to you and um, uh, these other lines that can be helpful. Um, let's... Uh, consider some additional information here that might be useful, and then we'll move on into the uh, question and answer session. There's a great uh, National Mental Health Institute uh, website with a section on men and mental health. I don't want to exclude uh, the women in our audience, but most of our Masons are men, and, mm -hmm. um, and so we want to uh, offer some special resources for them, particularly when uh, it, it seems often that uh, it's hard to find resources specifically for men. Mental Health America has got some good information there as well as the Men's Health Resource Center. Also, for those of you Masons out there who are um, connected with the mental health field in some way, you have a license or certification or you're a holder of an accredited graduate degree in a mental health field, there's a, a Facebook group for us. Uh, it's called Artifices Anime, and you can contact me or any of our other panelists about joining that group if you are connected with the mental health profession. By the way, if you're a retired professional, we would love to have you in that group as well. And we're going to move on. Please remember these guidelines during discussion, not to reveal any information that you want to keep private. Remember, this is not a therapy or counseling session. Um, we've got a number available there if you are in need of urgent help. We do welcome your questions. Um, we can take those by chat, and we'll try to take some of those by voice as well. No political commentary will be allowed during this conversation, and we will have the slideshow and a recording of the entire show available afterwards on the Refracted Light Facebook group. All right, so I'm going to stop the screen share, and... Um, I'm going to ask Brother Randy to step in at this point and help us out with questions from our audience. Thank you, Brother Chuck. That was amazing. It really was. Um, we have several folks that uh, joined halfway through. Um, feel free to ask questions and speak up. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, do we have anything? Go ahead and ch type it into the chat window. Whoops. I'd like to, if Doug Russell is still on, I'd like to specifically invite him. He's another mental health professional, Mason, out there, and I think he has a comment he might like to share with us. Doug, are you still out there? I am. Yes, I am. All right. Um, do you have a comment that you wanted to share with us? Well, yeah, I have a comment, and I have a question for two different panelists. The, the comment was, I believe it was Brother Eric Marks that uh, spoke of gratitude. And I just wanted to share this wonderful thing. It's kind of a prayer or an affirmation that has been so helpful to me about gratitude. And it goes like this. Thank you for everything. I have no complaint whatsoever. <laughs> that could be challenging, I think, to some of us. You know, I, I was on a, I was coming back from Guthrie one time and, and a plane that got diverted to Phoenix. I had to stay overnight at a hotel and I was very annoyed and upset about it. And I got into my room and I was just, I want to get home. What, how can they make me stay over at my room? Mm. And then I started saying that. And very quickly I noticed I was in a warm, comfortable room. I had books that I enjoy reading with me. Yes. I have these people in my life that love me gratitude popped in real quick and that it, it just was happened to be very effective for me in that circumstance. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm on the show that. Gratitude is a big thing, I think, a good thing for me. Uh, I agree. I'll, I think I'll have something else to say about that in a moment. But you said, I think that you had something for one of the yeah, other. There was panels. something I, and I don't know who, who said this. There was, there was on the list of bullet points and I may have just spaced out and not heard this, so forgive me. Don't, you don't have to respond if you said it and I didn't hear it. There was a bullet point that said something like Sufi story of about remembering. That's David that Hill. Story told. Did I did I miss it? If I did, I'm sorry. I'll pick it up on the recording. 
Thank you. David. Yeah, brother Doug, that was um, that oh, was in mine. That was Lorenzo. Okay. Yeah, Lorenzo. Yeah, I, good to um, see you. Oh yes, likewise, likewise. I um, I did pass that over. I was kind of uh, jumping around a little bit, uh, but when I was when I was planning everything out, I just remembered um, this like it's like a quick vignette, one of those pithy aphorisms that the the Sufis are are known for, and. Um, it was uh, about a certain dervish, as it always is, that uh, when offered any boon he could venture to think of, he asked that he never forget God, and it was done. And that was the secret of the dervish, for it got him every pleasure in the world. Um, I um, actually don't know uh, how that fit into everything. I think it was about um, this idea that, I mean, in everything I was saying, I, I, the, the goal is that when you are re-identified with your true nature, um, you know, lo loneliness is uh, not really there. It's to say that when I'm alone, I'm in the best company. Uh, that I think Carl Jung said. So it's kind of along those lines. Hmm. All right. Um, so the, the, to pick up on Doug's statement about gratitude, one of the things that I have noticed that when I'm really practicing gratitude, um, one of the things that comes naturally with that is greater compassion for others. And, um, and I remember when I first started consciously practicing gratitude as a contemplative discipline, it surprised me that compassion was right there as, as, as directly connected as it was to gratitude. So, so that's, that's a really useful thing for us to keep in mind. Doug, thanks for bringing it back to our attention. All right, um, Randy, what kind of question would you like to throw at us? <laughs> Put me on the spot, rock on. <laughs> with regard to uh, family, with regard to your spouse and working through um, stress, um, there, we had a lot of really good pointers I'll go with pointers and discussion um, given to us along that line from Brother Paul and, and crew. The where, where would I go with that? What are some of the other signs that I might look for um, with along with Paul and uh, uh, Eric's discussion? What are maybe some of the other signs I might look for to say, hey? I'm thinking that might not be the right place for you. Let's, let's go jump in the convertible and run down the road or let's go, let's go to the park or, you know, what, what kind of signs uh, besides the typical are you, are, are you, uh, um, might not be looking for? So I know I'll just speak for myself when, when I start to really feel anxious um, like I've been doing for the past half an hour, I start bouncing my legs up and down, you know, kind of uh, wiggling your feet around. Um, my wife's been mentioning it to me, uh, you know, we're starting to get ready for bed or whatever, and I might be sitting on the edge of the bed, and she's like, what the heck are you doing with your feet? Um, so sometimes you might see it in yourself, or you might see it in kids or spouses, you know, people living at your house, uh, acting differently, maybe, you know, seem tense, seem a little goofier. Um, I know that's, you know, I, I get silly when I get really stressed. Uh, so just if you start, uh, I see Brother Grubbs out there very much agreeing with me. Um, you know, it's one of those things where that's my way to blow off steam. Uh, because I, I've done the anger thing. You know, I've done drinking more than I should thing. And it just, it, it doesn't work. Uh, and when I start being who I really am, uh, that's one way that I can kind of mm -hmm. yeah. blow off that stress and just, for me, usually it's the anxiousness. If you're watching someone else, like, you know, thinking about it, if I'm watching a, a student or, um, I was talking to, uh, one brother, uh, who recently had a divorce and talking about, uh, interactions in his household and just overall, and we can usually tell when something's not quite right. We might not be able to put our finger on it, but there's something there. So I think just being open and honest about that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hey, uh, 
grubs. I noticed that, you know, you're, you're not on Facebook as much as you have been lately, or, you know, you're, I haven't seen you in a while, you know, just saying, Hey, um, a, a lot of times that's enough to engage somebody and kind of bring them out of the, the funk. So a follow up to that. Th thank you for that. Cause that's, that that's exactly what I was looking for. And, and it leads me to my follow up, which is a lot of times we see in our, in our spouse, a reflection of our own selves or our own mm. actions. And, um, the reason that I, I say that is that uh, I see if I'm getting stressed, I can see a difference in her reaction to me. And with that in mind, is there any follow-up that you guys might want to talk about to help us collectively uh, pay more attention to that or tune into that a little bit better? One thing we brought up in the last conversation was um, grounding. And so there's a grounding technique I use with uh, kiddos in school, uh, you know, just different individuals in the world uh, to where you basically use your hand. You know, I'm in elementary, so a lot of things are hands, whether we're doing deep breathing, breathe on the way, breathe in, out, in, out. And then I love getting over here because you get to go out all the way to the elbow. Uh, but, you know, so if you do the grounding techniques, there's a five, four, three, two, one method. You know, five things you can see, uh, four things you can hear, three things you can touch, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. And I think I might have actually got that straight this time. <laughs> Any order you get it in, if you can find enough things to taste, I guess go around. Not right now. I guess we're uh, anti-licking <laughs> strange things. But you see where I'm going with that. If you can get it, it just helps you focus on the moment. Um, so, you know, doing that, you know, walk outside, even if you're not getting out of sight a whole lot, if there's some grass, take your shoes off, go actually stand in the grass, get some of the sunshine on you. Uh, just being really mindful of where you are. And if you're having a big reaction to something, slowing down and saying, okay, is this what's got me going or is it something else? Um, I used to use one. Uh, that was halt, and I still have a poster at school. Uh, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. It was on a stop sign. So if you start having a big reaction, are you hungry? Uh, are you angry about something else? Are you lonely? Do you feel excluded from something? I mean, even though we're here in this group, I can't seem to stop talking. So some of these guys <laughs> may feel like they're alone. Uh, or are you just tired? You know, I, I think we've all at one point had or seen a kiddo, you know, three, four, five, six years old, who at the end of the night, they're doing this. And you say, hey, you tired? You ready for bed? No, I'm awake. So, uh, or a spouse, you know, it happens. So there, there may be something else underlying that is affecting us, having a, a effect on us. And I'm going to mute myself because I can't seem to stop. <laughs> you know, Randy, uh, you, you, what you said about spouses uh, made me think of a couple things. Um, one, uh, it, it's important to pick up what we might be projecting onto others of our own mm. stuff uh, versus what they may actually be experiencing. And we don't necessarily know exactly what, the, we don't have any way of seeing into their head directly, you know. Um, if we did, that'd be a real bad situation. Uh, <laughs> But um, you know, make sure you're not projecting your stuff on there. Um, also, uh, some things, something that that I don't think we touched on is withdrawal. So if people start withdrawing, uh, you know, maybe they're irritable, they're grumpy, or whatever. Yeah, but if they start withdrawing and just not interacting, uh, that may be a sign you might want to talk to them a little bit. I know one of the things my wife and I have uh, had. Uh, kind of a conflict with structure because usually after the day's over um, we would uh, after we're done with our work and our extra projects and stuff we'd spend a couple hours in the evening uh, eating dinner together uh, checking in maybe watching some some uh, Netflix or something and then going to bed uh, and that that sort of evening check-in time when I'm not out doing Masonic stuff is is part of our schedule well um, we found ourselves after our work without our any of our extra stuff in the evenings that we normally do uh, Just stuck in the house together for hours and she's a nice lady 
Uh, but when we're feeling forced to spend this time together and uh, really shoehorn in this, this little bit of structured stuff that we usually do into this larger amount of time, uh, it, it got kind of forced and weird and uh, uncomfortable. So we had to talk about, you know, just because we're in the same space doesn't mean we need to hang out together all the time. Uh, it felt like we were being impolite for not uh, for doing our own things. But since we've sort of fallen into a rhythm of, of doing our own things and it's given each other the space to where it's much more tolerable. You know, we love each other, but also it's nice to have a little bit of uh, time to yourself. So I think that's an important thing to look at. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, while I'm at it, one thing uh, Doug said about his gratitude practice, uh, I, I think that's really important is that that sort of the grounding, that checking in. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that, that I was exposed to is this idea of the underlying ground of being. And this is a concept where, say you're on vacation. You know, it usually takes you two or three days to sort of get settled on vacation. All the worries of, of your day, your work, your, your normal life sort of melt away. And then you're just there. You're just enjoying. You're sitting by the lake, you know, sipping your scotch, just enjoying the beauty of nature, feeling relaxed. Well, a lot of this anxiety and stuff is just up here. I mean, we, we do it to ourselves. It's sort of, it's sort of this reflexive mm -hmm. way we almost torture ourselves and, and negative messaging and all of that. If I'm feeling really stressed out, uh, I'll just pause and I'll look around myself, kind of like Paul was saying with this mm -hmm. is five, four, three, two, one thing, and just kind of look around. Am I in, am I in a warm, comfortable room? Like Doug said, you know, uh, am I safe? Am I okay right now in this moment? Because that underlying ground of being, that state of relaxation, we can tap into that at any moment. We just have to remind ourselves it's there and allow ourselves to relax and let all that anxiety and tension just go. It doesn't have to be there. And that's something that's probably good to do several times a day. Very cool. So one, one of the things I'd like to pick up on from, from your question, Randy, is about communication in relationships. One of the most important things that we can do is communicate about how we communicate. And um, often people who are spouses or domestic partners, um, in this situation, they're not, as, as we have pointed out, others have pointed out, we're not used to spending as much time around each other. Um, and now all of a sudden, we're in immediate proximity all of the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so some of the unwritten rules about how we communicate with each other uh, may no longer apply because we might have had unwritten rules about, okay, when we come home, then this is the way we talk to each other. But that's not happening now. We're always home. So how have the rules changed? And how do we need to talk about, you know, when we talk and how we talk to each other? Um, is it okay if I'm starting to feel stressed to be able to say, I can't have this conversation right now, please give me some time and I'll be ready once I kind of get things settled down and I know where my head's at and what my thoughts and feelings are about this. Is it possible for us to do that? And just coming to that agreement is, is a wonderful thing, not just for now, but in terms of relationship building itself. Um, so Communicating about communicating is a huge thing that I want to encourage everybody to think about. How could that be part of, of, of my adaptation to what's going on? All right. Um, I just want to make a comment here. Lynn Chow said in chat that if you can't find one thing to taste in that grounding exercise, that she likes the idea of one thing for which you're grateful and doesn't that tie two things together really nicely there, Lynn? Well done. Mm -hmm. All right, other comments or questions from anyone? I think kind of to talk to uh, David's point about the interactions with him and his wife and just having so much more time. One thing we've really focused on in my house uh, is you know, having lunch together, you know, yeah. we'll have dinner together, maybe even have breakfast together. Um, you know, it's different because now we're splitting a pot of coffee. It's not usually mm -hmm. the way it would go. I would take one little cup, if anything, and she would get mm -hmm. her pot of coffee before she left for school and then have some at school. So, you know, kind of having those little date lunches 
those date dinners and spending mm -hmm. time with each other, I think uh, can be a big help. And other than that, you know, if we see each other, great. But if we don't, we both got things to do and that's okay too. All right, we do have a question out there. Uh, Mike Grubbs is asking, what about sleep? Uh, can, can we let Mike into the conversation here, Randy? Yeah, Mike, can you unmute or do you need me to unmute you? Do, 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 do. I got it. All right. Uh, you Thank you, Randy. No, my, my question is, is uh, and it's really not based on anybody, uh, but in the essential category, I've been going to work every day through this, and my sleep has suffered greatly. And, um, you know, still trying to stay to my routine, uh, I'm limiting the time that um, my, my screen time, I'm trying to shut it off and have no screen time between a set amount of time and when I actually lay down to go to sleep. And I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with, especially when they're really stressed out, uh, <clears throat> that uh, finding a good sleep habit, and I think this panel is really well-rounded tonight, and that uh, asking the question, well, how, how do we help our sleep uh, amidst this crisis, whether it's, you know, real or not real, or, or you know, the results are real, or our personal feelings on it. The, the question is, you know, what about sleep? Mm -hmm. How do we find a healthy way to uh, encourage good sleep hygiene and be able to really refocus ourselves every day to actually some of the things that the panel talked about tonight, be able to move forward in doing those things effectively, whether it's, you know, communicating about communicating with your spouse or your partner, whether it's, you know, trying to help someone, you know, be more productive, even if they're in that, that out of control wobble of unbalance. Um, but it all starts with sleep because if you're not sleeping, none of this stuff's going to work. Great point, Mike. Mm -hmm. uh, so any of our panelists want to uh, want to pick up this topic of sleep and particularly how can we make sure we're getting the best sleep possible? Mm -hmm. right. I can I'll be happy to. Oh, yeah, Frank, I'm here. Well, I, at the VA, I do groups and individual therapy on cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And when you, when, when you talk about sleep, everybody knows that the body needs sleep. It's a reboot for the body. Uh, it's very important. Now, my wife would tell you that uh, she would accuse me of being asleep before my head hits the pillow. Um, and, and even in my days as a soldier, um, I usually had no problem going to sleep. And, I, and, I, and it kind of boggles my mind why, why people have problems sleeping. What's there to think about? What's there... You, you hear the typical, I can't turn my mind off. You know, the nocturnal rumination. Um, the, the brain weasels are constantly going. Um, and perhaps you, you've, you mentioned um, one thing, Mike, about cutting out your electronics because uh, studies are showing that the light coming from iPads, phones, TVs, it jacks with the circadian rhythm. Because as we sleep and we reboot the body, you're starting to build up that sleep drive. Okay. And then eventually, you know, you, you want to, as you, we work, we work, we come home, we play with the kids, watch TV, whatever. And it's time to crash, time to go down. Um, one of the things to, or several things to look at is, is the room dark, cool, quiet, um, no electronics in the room other than, you know, the last time I look at this thing is when I set the alarm because it's my alarm clock. Okay. Um, I had a patient one time who um, she decided to stop all electronic usage about one hour before she went to bed and she increased her sleep from one hour to four hours. She also looked at medications. Sometimes medications, the way you take them and when you take them can jack with your, with your rhythm. Okay. Um, if you're the worry wart and you're constantly going through your, you know, God, what am I doing tomorrow? What am I doing tomorrow? Um, and, and you got that nocturnal thing going, one of the things that will knock you out is try to read the King James Bible. Now, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not disrespecting religion. I'm not respecting any version of the Bible, but there's something about that language, the way it's written, 
Now, granted, if you go from Genesis 1 to Revelation 21, you got bigger problems than any of us can handle. <laughs> okay? <laughs> all right? <clears throat> but in all seriousness, when you start reading that, there's something about that language, that old, that old English language that just starts to lull you. Another couple of techniques is if you have a favorite passage of scripture, a prayer, um, ritual, Masonic ritual, and your mind's racing, okay, all right, while you're laying there, start conferring the EA degree, okay, or go through the Q&A, all right, open up a master's lodge, <laughs> right, you know, right in your head, okay, because what happens is that it distracts the, the brain weasels, and you have to focus on something else, and all of a sudden, your body goes, oh, it's time to go sleep, okay, um, <clears throat> diet could have an impact depending on what you eat when you eat how you eat you want to gain weight go to bed immediately after you eat guaranteed to gain weight you'll put it on like that um the the conventional wisdom is don't eat you know once you finish your last meal the clock starts ticking and then two hours later you can go to bed okay more time for that to digest um if you are uh, an exercise kind of guy and you start working out in the evening it might fire up all your endorphins and keep you pumped up while you're trying to go down okay so yeah, if you're going to work out work out as soon as you get home you know, if you get home at five or whatever um, or work out first thing in the morning but what's happening during the day is we're trying to build up that sleep drive so that at night we begin to go down um, and whatever your normal nighttime routine is okay you know, let the dogs in and out for the last time. You're checking the house for security, making sure the kids are good to go, everybody's safe. Brush your teeth, take a shot, whatever you do, and get in bed. Um, but that bed, the most important thing about sleep, the bed equals sleep, okay? You read any kind of literature on insomnia, they're gonna tell you the bed is only for two things, sleep and sex, okay? Now I say three things I like to read. <laughs> Okay, and I'll tell you what, if I have insomnia, if I can't sleep, Albert Pike does the trick. <laughs> <Okay>. um, <clears throat> but when you, when you go into that bedroom, your mindset is already set on, no, it's, it's time to go. I flipped the switch. I'm, I'm ready to go to sleep. But the bed equals sleep. That's number one. Make sure your bed's comfortable. Are you, are you, uh, free of distractions. I already talked about having the room nice and dark, cool, comfortable, um, safe. Um, you know, the only thing, like I said, the only time I look at this is when I set it, I plug it in, and then I go and do my nighttime ablutions, and then I'm ready to go to bed. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, but yeah, you, you need sleep. Now, how much sleep do you need? Well, you can Google that, and you're going to find a there's just disparity like from 24 to 67 that you need seven, six to eight hours. And I'm like, that's a huge gap there. <laughs> that's a huge amount. Here's the thing. If you can be fully functional at four hours of sleep, what's the problem? Okay. All right. If you can be, if you need five, great. I'll tell you right now, if I sleep past seven o'clock in the morning on a day off, I think I've slept the day away. I've got to get up. I've got to get moving. Um, <clears throat> there's just something about that I, I've got to get out of that bed and get moving. Because uh, if I stay in there too long, the back, the knees, the hips, you know, you start to get a little antsy. Okay? You just can't rest. Um, what happens if you wake up at, say, 3 o'clock in the morning and you can't go back to sleep and your alarm's set for 6? Okay? Well, if you can't go back to sleep, get up get up walk out of the bedroom go sit in the living room or something you know you can do your little to-do list out there um if you need to schedule worry time fine do it then if you feel sleepy go try to go back to bed again okay um what happens if you wake up say you know 20 15 minutes prior to the alarm going off get out of bed you know why is it that the best time to go to sleep is when you have to get up <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever notice that? <laughs> right, because you're comfortable, right? But if you do wake up earlier, okay, than the alarm, and I'm talking 15, 20 minutes, 
to get out of bed and go about your day. Okay. All right. Hope that hope that helps. Eric, did you have something to add? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, really grateful that Frank went first because uh, I don't have any of that. I, I was thinking that um, along with uh, insomnia, sometimes people want to take naps during the day, and I, I really discourage uh, naps. I think you know, a brief one. So if you sleep for under 20 minutes, sometimes that can be pretty restful and, and resets things. But if you actually go into deep sleep, then it makes it difficult to fall asleep. One of the, the things that I hear people say over and over and over again is, I'll just try and go to bed earlier because I, I was, you know, my sleep cycles off. And the problem with that is our, what resets our clock is when we get up. And so trying to go to bed earlier when you're when you've woken up at noon or one o'clock isn't going to work because your brain's saying yeah we got another 15 hours to go here mm -hmm. so the, the best thing to do in in my opinion is to stay awake so if you're having trouble going falling asleep it's three in the morning don't go to bed like you're saying frank just stay awake mm -hmm. stay up and then don't nap during the day the other thing that for so many students and it's happened to me too and maybe this goes to Mike's question, you've tried all of these things, nothing's working, you've tried medicines, and and I know people who, it's the thing we talk about for years, like I just can't sleep. So then my recommendation is do the next best thing, is you try and put your head down, and you try and just be restful. And I know for years I spent you know, looking at the clock, I've got this big meeting, I'm gonna be talking with all these people around, you know, I wish I could meet with all of you in person, but so I get, you know, more and more wound up about the fact that I'm not sleeping, which makes it harder to sleep. So lay down, close my eyes, try and remember something that's pleasing, might be being in lodge, sitting in lodge with all of you. And just try and be still. And when my mind starts going to whatever it might be, that worries me. It's just saying, you know, all I have to do is rest. It's the next best thing. I can't sleep. That's okay. I'm just going to rest as much as I can. That's it. I'll, uh, I'll add just a few things quickly to that and then we'll move on to something else. Um, so things that I have found helpful with uh, some of the clients that I have worked with are, uh, and, and again, these may be things that Mike or other people have tried and, and maybe some people haven't tried. So sleep sounds, uh, you can actually get um, apps that will help with this or you can buy, um, uh, soundtracks that will help you sleep. Just putting on easy listening music can make a difference. It works on that same principle Frank was talking about. It actually distracts your mind enough from the stuff that is rolling over and over in the squirrel cage mm -hmm. to help you really relax and the sleep cycle to kick in. Mm -hmm. um, practices that you can do to help you sleep is when you lay down, you know the old thing about counting sheep? Just counting your breaths. Uh, can be one of the things that can help you. You might find that all of a sudden you realize you stopped counting, you know, and that you drifted off for a little bit. Okay, just pick the count back up and you'll drift off again. Um, I've gotten to some pretty high numbers with that one myself, but it still works nonetheless. Um, you'll hear people talking about using alcohol or cannabis to help them sleep. Um, while those things can help you slip into sleep in the short term, they can also interrupt and, and mess with your sleep cycle. They can, they actually have been shown in research to interfere with getting into the deeper levels of sleep where you get the real uh, refreshing, rejuvenating kind of sleep that, that most of us need. Um, and then also I would say that if you're noticing that a lack of sleep is, is uh, interfering with your mood and creating mood problems there, that what you do is maybe take more frequent breaks during the day to do some relaxation, uh, turning inward, and kind of giving yourself some of that break and some of the refreshing rejuvenation that sleep would give you, but just enough to kind of settle yourself down um, and, and recenter a little bit. Okay. Other questions or comments from anyone? Joseph says he likes guided meditation for sleep. You know, for me, when I'm having real problems sleeping in the middle of the night, um, Bob Ross is on Netflix. <laughs> that painting. That guy yeah. in his happy little trees, that soft voice. He was a drill instructor. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. yes. That guy, yes. that soft voice, that scratching on that little pout, man, puts me right down. <clears throat> yep, good boy. <laughs> there's, right. there's, a great, there's a great app called um, 
CBTI Coach. It's capital C, uh, capital B, capital T, hyphen, little I, Coach. And um, there's a lot of little tabs on it. I don't know if you can see that from here or not, but um, when you go to the Learn tab, there's a lot of things on there. So it talks about habits and sleep, scheduling worry time. Uh, it talks about the stages of sleep. Uh, but really, one of the neat things is the tool section, and it has a section called Quiet Your Mind. And we talked about those mindful meditations. And it has winding down, it has a breathing tool, and it has several progressive, um, I don't know if you often see that, progressive meditations that you can just listen to. And you just push play and just sit back and just close your eyes and, and, and meditate. It's a guided meditation and it's, a, it's really neat. CBTI coach or CBT hyphen I coach. You'll see a, a crescent moon as, one of the, as the icon. So. Good stuff. Um, all right. <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. Lynn's giving us the graphic there. All right. Um, other questions from the audience. Randy, have you received any uh, from our live feed at all? No, we're, we, we did talk uh, briefly about uh, progressive re muscle relaxation. Lynn brought yeah. that up, um, which is pretty funny. I've always called it progressive indirect relaxation from the, well, from, from the uh, Philippine martial yeah. arts, the uh, progressive direct attack. Uh, progressive mm -hmm. indirect attack and and that just made more sense to me but that's funny mm -hmm. um and then uh mike said asmr i asmr works uh well for a lot of people mike what is asmr whoops he's there he's just trying to get unmute unmuted i'm trying to hit unmute for him i'm gonna quit there you, there go. you go sorry about that um ASMR is, give me one second, I'm having a brain fart. It's Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. That one, there it is. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you knew that. <laughs> and Yeah, that rolls well, right off the tongue. The, 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 the thing that's interesting about it is, is a lot of the experiences that you listen to on a YouTube video or through an app are experiences that a lot of people have already had. One of those uh, that is my favorite is getting my hair cut. I enjoy that probably. Mm. I, I, I could get my hair cut three days a week and I would be okay with that. And that is one of the most relaxing videos for me to watch and listen to. And I can literally fall asleep just listening to somebody get their hair cut. Um, because it, for some reason it clicks with the brain that that's a relaxing activity for myself. And then all of a sudden I'm relaxed. It, it is, is, it's a very interesting phenomenon on how that uh, works. Um, the quiet, the squirrel cage. Yeah. Thanks Mike. Um, you know, there's nothing like golf on a Sunday afternoon on TV to put me right out. <laughs> Um, but um, I want to I want to shift the conversation a little bit because one of the things that this brought up for me connected with an earlier conversation and, and that is how the lack of sleep can affect our mood mm -hmm. and one of the things that is important for us and particularly now in our new relationship contexts you know that we're experiencing because of the, the shutdowns is just being mindful of our own emotional state. This is not something that a lot of us were taught to do uh, as children. Most of the time we were taught, uh, if we were getting any lesson, uh, particularly those of us who were conditioned into traditional male uh, types of, of uh, stereotypes, we were taught to ignore our emotions and even deny them. And so practicing emotional mindfulness, just checking in with myself routinely, how am I feeling? Am I feeling a little pissy right now? You know, and, and what's that about? And how's that affecting the way that I'm hearing what other people have to say? And how's that affecting the way that I'm saying the things that I feel like I need to say? How's it affecting the way that I'm making decisions about what I need to say or not to say? So practicing that emotional mindfulness 
is, I think, a really, really important technique. And, and think about this as an opportunity now. If, if this is, is something that you're becoming aware of, that you're a little more moody than usual right now, you've got an opportunity to develop a practice that can pay benefits even when times get easier. Uh, being mindful of joy, being mindful of all of the wonderful things, comfort and peace mm -hmm. and happiness that you can experience with other people to actually recognize that you're experiencing those things and becoming aware of how they affect your mood mm -hmm. is, is such a powerful thing. Definitely co connects with the practice of gratitude. Very cool. We don't have any other questions on the chat. Uh, last time, maybe around the table. Sounds good. Well, thank you, Chuck, for putting this together. Um, this has been, I think, I think Randy alluded to it the first time that anything like this in masonry has been done with this kind of format uh, and, and title uh, to have mental health professionals who, who are masons to come in and, and talk a little bit about different things to help our brothers out a little bit and those who uh, others in the audience. Uh, it's, it's been a great experience and I thank you for putting it together and uh, I hope it's not the last time we do this. Thank you, Frank. I really appreciate your help with this very much. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. I, I wanted to um, kind of riff off of something you said, Chuck, for a moment. You mentioned being conditioned into traditional mail. Um, you know, since a, a bunch of Masons are going to be seeing this, hopefully, uh, wanted to uh, make a note about that because growing up, you know, I was, grew up pretty traditionally and, uh, you know, you're taught to suppress your feelings, you know, just be kind of stoic on the outside and, and just tough it out, get through it. Uh, thing is, you still have those feelings. You might be chucking them into a little container or a little box and hoping that stays shut, but that just increases pressure. It's like a jack in the box. One day it's just going to pop open. You're going to explode everywhere. And it's, mm -hmm. it's not a productive way to go about it. So what Chuck was saying about like really recognizing your emotions, they're kind of like another sense. So like a sixth sense. Um, it's just kind of like smelling, smelling uh, something burning. You're like, where's a fire? You know, if you start to feel a little bit angry, you know, am I feeling hungry? Did somebody do something aggressive towards me? It, it gives you a clue about what's going on in your surroundings. And also, as men, we tend to be conditioned to, like, not really be emotionally available uh, around each other especially, which just mainly our romantic partners and that's it. So I would really encourage people, uh, you know, open up to your brothers. If you are having a hard time. If you are starting to feel depressed or anxious, I mean, probably we're all doing that. So uh, having some conversations with people, some open, honest conversations about just how you're feeling, probably go a long ways. Thank you all, uh, appreciate it. It's been a fantastic evening. Thank you, David. I really appreciate your contribution. Thank you. I'll echo what everybody else has said. I think this has been a really good experience. Um, it's been neat to just feel like we're actually doing something. Uh, yeah. you know, brother Hill has, he's doing a grief support group in Austin, um, with Masons. And that, that was really the first time I had thought about something like that. I mean, it, I'd had it pop into my mind over the years, you know, is there something we can do, you know, for me, mostly kids, you know, thinking about, um, uh, you know, sharing groups, you know, uh, social skills type things, friendship groups. Um, but one thing that he mentioned just now was being yourself. You know, it's something I talk about with my kids at school all the time. You know, the same thing, traditional growing up, you know, my mom, uh, she was actually just on here. She logged off. It's her bedtime. Uh, but, you know, super supportive. But she raised me and my brother in Round Rock as a single parent. And she was uh, very... We had, we had a lot of great guys in our lives, uh, a lot of Masons that I didn't find out about until about five years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. They just happened to be around uh, to help us out. And growing up, you know, we, we didn't live in a nice neighborhood. We single parent household in the 80s and, you know, all this other stuff. And when I quit being who I thought I was supposed to be, the bad kid, the poor kid, the this, the, the tough kid, the whatever, and just started being who I was, that's when things got easier for me. Uh, so, you know, kind of like David was saying, mm -hmm. if you can connect and give yourself permission 
to be who you are. And it's not a license to just go around being a jerk, but, you know, to say, hey, you know, I, I feel this way. And, you know, earlier we were talking about conversations about having conversations. And, you know, that goes into, you know, your love languages. And like my wife and I sitting down and saying, hey, this is, this is what I feel when I say this, I need you to do that. You know, when I say I need a break, I've had too much. I need you to leave me alone. And, uh, you know, all those things are so important, but at the root of it, if we can just, um, you know, be who we are, uh, try to reintegrate that uh, very basic emotional feeling and give ourselves permission to do that, things change. Um, there was a brother not too long ago, we were in Lodge, and uh, he's a very serious type of guy, very serious voice. Uh, commanding tone, uh, you know, military experience. And I was sitting next to him. Uh, he was a senior warden and I was master of ceremonies. And when he was uh, opening and closing the lodge, he was screaming. And I was like, man, would you quiet down? You're, you're scaring me. I can't hear over here. And we had a goofy moment that we probably didn't need to have during that, you know, open up, opening and closing a lodge. But I think it was really good. It was something that stuck with me about being being a person with a person. You know, there's a time and a place for everything. But if you can take that moment to actually connect with somebody, I think it does everybody a lot of good. So, but thank you very much for you guys, you know, uh, Chuck and Randy really putting this together and pulling everything together and all the other panelists. Uh, you know, I, I feel... Um, very fortunate, blessed to be amongst these guys and proud to know two of them really well. Three, you know, I've gotten to know Chuck really well. They're starting to get to know Chuck really well over the past <laughs> couple of years. Uh, you know, Frank's just right up the road when I did the York right. Mm -hmm. He was part of the guys who, uh, in Temple, they did it uh, courtesy. And uh, David is a Worshipful Master right now in Austin. I'm Worshipful Master at uh, Bocus. So, you know, coming together in these different groups and being involved, you know, the Scottish Rite, the Shrine, these different things. It's, it's really neat to know these guys so well and be able to do something helpful, hopefully. Thank you, Paul. Really appreciate it. Uh, so Eric, Lorenzo, either one of you want to go next? Well, I'll, I'll say, uh, I echo everyone's thanks for this opportunity. And, and I always appreciate, uh, we say it over and over again, that that this uh, fraternity brings me in contact with people and ideas that I, I wouldn't be as close to. And it, it really helps me. I think both Frank and, and, uh, and Paul uh, mentioned the idea of, you know, sort of both looking at reality, but then also doing things that shift our perception and our understanding of ourselves. And to me, that's one of the, one, there's so many gifts that I get from being associated with all of you. And so being able to shift my point of view uh, causes me to lose my train of thought. So there you go. That's it. Stop right there. <laughs> All right. That's well, it. I'm if done. It, if it comes back <laughs> to you, Eric, let us know. Lorenzo. Um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to echo all the same sentiments as well. And, um, and, and thank everyone for putting this together, for listening, for contributing. I guess on a closing note, we've had uh, the theme of, of gratitude. Uh, come up a number of times. And I, I just wanted to reiterate what a powerful emotion it is. Mm. And, um, you know, this idea of, of being, being your, yourself, your true self, um, practicing gratitude or experiencing it just in and of itself is like kind of, you know, unconditional. So um, if you were to, I, I'm, I'm coming more from like um, looking at the, the bioelectric field. I have this sort of fledgling model I'm trying to develop that our emotions are like reverberations in our bioelectric field. And um, if, you know, if energy cannot be created or destroyed, if you practice gratitude, contact it, feel it, uh, it it's probably coming out of whatever else you was, was there at the time. So, I mean, this would be a great way to just kind of um, to contact all this other stuff we're talking about. And probably, um, you know, instead of looking at the thoughts, trying to deal with them, uh, oftentimes it is the, the emotional a component that's um, where the real work has to be done. It's hard to do, but gratitude seems to be this golden key that's so readily available. So again, thank you all.
and I hope we all uh, practice our gratitude. Thank you, Lorenzo. Eric, did anything else come to you? <laughs> oh, no, I'm not going to get started now. Thanks. <laughs> okay. all right. Really grateful. <laughs> well, I want to thank all of our panelists for uh, sharing your experience and knowledge with us. I want to thank um, Randy for handling the technical side of all of this and making sure we had a more secure environment this time. That was very deeply appreciated, my brother. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the audience members out there who um, have been listening in, those of you who have participated in the conversation. Um, I want you to be thinking about the fact that you now have mental health professionals in the craft that can serve as resources for you. Um, uh, so, like I said, if, if you are a mental health professional or, or credentialed with a graduate degree or something like that, and you want to join the Artifices Anime Facebook group, please do. If you are not, but you would really like to bring in someone that might could do a lodge program or some other Masonic body that could uh, benefit from having some sort of mental health and masonry programming um, in your Masonic organization, uh, please feel free to contact any of our panelists or contact me. I'm sure we'll be happy to work with you. And um, thank you once again for, for being here this evening. And I, I hope all things are going well with you and yours. And uh, looking forward to the time when we can all look back on this and realize the wonderful lessons that we have learned and the great skills and wisdom that we have developed as a result of facing this challenge together. And Randy, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Brother Chuck, so much. Okay, folks, uh, wrapping it up now. Uh, hit the uh, stop recording button here in a moment. And... <laughs>